Hello and welcome to the I Am Woman Project, where every week we have deep thought-provoking and interesting conversations with thought leaders, change instigators, rule breakers and creative minds who think differently, sparking creativity and inspiration. Our special guests on our show cover a variety of topics just for you and they share their personal stories to inspire, motivate and empower you, our listener. The I Am Woman podcast is produced for your enjoyment and show notes are found at www.catherineplano.com. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. All links are in the show notes. Now let's get into the show. Today we have the authentic Jemima Ashley, who is the creative director of Tanks Design, director of Epic Social, and one half of the Business Experiment podcast. Jemima has been named one of Australia's top 10 female entrepreneurs. She is passionate about startups and loves all things business. She is passionate about breaking through myths and misconceptions about being an entrepreneur and thrives on helping other businesses succeed. Jemima is a raw, natural-born artist, a skilled improviser and comedian. In 2015, Jemima was named Canberra's Artist of the Year. Jemima also has extensive studies in the fields of security, intelligence and speaks several languages. She currently works extensively as a mentor, comedy writer, a speaker and also a social media guru. She loves blogging and is a regular contributor to multiple media outlets. Jemima brings an original, quirky sense of humour and a fun-loving attitude to everything that she does. She is passionate about helping people to express their individuality and creativity. She believes good things come to those who are willing to get up and get shit done. It's time to strap yourself in to this inspirational woman. Enjoy. Today we have a very special guest for you, a very energetic special guest, Jemima Ashley. Welcome to I Am One Project. Hi, Catherine. Thank you for having me. No, thank you. And I thought we better start recording because we're having some juicy conversations about lots of things. And for our listeners, if you have a cup of coffee, put that down because Jemima is going to blow your mind with all the energy that is going (laughs) on in Canberra. There's a little bit, I apologize. I'm not really going to apologize though. I've had a bit of sugar today and a bit of caffeine. That's how entrepreneurs get through, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So Jemima, for our listeners, let's unpack Jemima Ashley and tell us your story. Mm. Oh, it's such a big story. Um, so I grew up in rural Victoria uh, in a little place called East Gippsland, a little town called Munro, and uh, had a hundred people in it. And I grew up there until I was 18 and went to university in Melbourne. I Ended up studying security and criminal intelligence at university and then joined law enforcement for about 10 years. I was deployed over to New York for a couple of months where I had a chance encounter with a silversmith that kind of changed my life and I ended up becoming an entrepreneur and things took a really big turn in uh, 2015. Mm, and we were just talking about some of those businesses mm. that you have. You have uh, lots, well, three actually. So there's Tang's mm. Design, the Business Experiment, and Epic Social. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about those? Sure. So Tang's Design is a bespoke jewelry business which specialises in doing colourful yet unique classic pieces of jewelry. So the jewelry is inexpensive and is just beautiful that you can wear to any occasion. And that was a business that I started in 2015 after meeting this beautiful silversmith in New York. Um, The Business Experiment is a podcast that was started in 2016 with my fantastic girlfriend, Siobhan Joyce, who I know is coming on your podcast very shortly. And Siobhan and I um, have been friends since kindergarten and started a podcast that was going to focus on the business real. From that, we ended up having a lot of inquiries about growing a podcast and Epic Social was born, which specializes in training people in social media and how to authentically tell your story to make it not boring for your people. So our tagline is we don't do boring. So we'll show you how to make your social media epic. 
Mm, I love that we don't do boring. So Jemima, talk us through the podcast because I love what you were saying beforehand about the whole journey of when you and your girlfriend were setting up your business and so forth. So talk us through that. Yeah, so Siobhan and I have known each other since we were in kindergarten. So we're five years old when we met and um, we've just always remained in each other's lives. And I think, you know, with inventions such as Facebook and social media, it made it a bit easier to keep in touch. And Siobhan was starting a business, um, a coaching business, and I'd been in business for about 12, 18 months. And she was con- she was consistently messaging me and asking me questions that were pretty basic, but just general advice. You know, how do you get an AVN? How do you set up this? What sort of social media should I be using? What's my ideal client? What does that look like? And we just thought we were hilarious. Like we cracked each other up and we ended up having a conversation one day um, about how hilariously funny we were while I was sitting on the beach in Cottesloe in Western Australia and she was in Melbourne. And um, I hung the phone up and went, ha ha, we are hilarious. You're right. And I read an article um, that someone had tagged me in on how to get ahead in business. And the article was really full of really factually incorrect information. It was just rubbish that entrepreneurs were reading and people were being tagged in it and there was thousands of shares on this article. And the tips were like do meditation three times a day, eat an orange at the start of the day, make sure that you're getting enough sleep. This is not practical advice. And I rang Siobhan back and I was like, mate, we need to do something. This is ridiculous. Let's start a podcast. So we named it there and then the business experiment and the experiment was can we start a podcast and can it work and turn into a business? And, uh, yeah, so it's just had its first year's birthday and the business experiment's been an absolute adventure. So we promised ourselves and our listeners that we were going to tell you the good, the bad and the ugly about being in business and you were going to follow our entrepreneurial journeys as entrepreneurs as we grew and developed in the first year of business. Oh, I love that. And talk us through what you were saying before about Shark Tank and how many downloads and so forth, just so that our listeners get a bit of insight how big it is. Yeah, so it grew, like so one of the things that Chev and I talked about initially was, oh, let's just start a podcast. How like it's going to be great even if no one listens, it's going to be fine because it will have a record of what we've done even if it's just our parents. The joke was kind of on us because we scaled way too quickly. We ended up, um, you know, first couple of weeks we ended up getting contacted, I think it was six or eight weeks after the podcast started and it was a from a PR firm that was associated with um, one of the winners of Shark Tank. And, you know, can can my client come on your podcast? I think she'd be a great fit. I love your podcast. And sort of going, oh, okay, so this is a thing. This is interesting. And then, um, you know, we started to see the country count, which started at, you know, five or six countries were listening in and then it was 10 and now it's, you know, upwards of 50 countries who are tuning in on a regular basis and listening to us. And we ran some stats and we're sort of like, oh, how far are we going and, you know, we're sitting at about 3 million people who have just been seeing our stuff on Facebook and um, that's been our reach so far. It's just, it's been incredible. Like, it's been such an amazing journey and we just it come from this beautiful, simple idea sitting on the beach in Cottesloe of let's tell the truth about what it's like to be in business. Let's tell people the good, the bad and the ugly. Mm, I love it. And so when you're talking about Facebook, were you advertising your podcast or was it just like just in your feeds, just talking about business, sharing the content, that kind of thing? Initially, no, we weren't. We didn't do any advertising and we don't really do a lot of advertising now. Um, one of the things that we did do really well is Storytel. We let people know when we were recording. We, we we told the truth about it. We, you know, I'm having a bad day today and I have to record a podcast. This is terrible. We did a lot of Facebook Lives. We did a lot of little videos. We did a lot of, you know, Instagram posts between each other. We tag, you know, Chev and I would have conversations online that our listeners could listen to and watch what was unfolding. Um, and we'd screenshot text messages. They were the things that really showed behind the scenes that we were legitimate people and that we were telling, you know, we were te- authentically telling our story and that's where sort of where Epic Social came in and that's mm. kind of how it was born because this is what we were doing anyway. Absolutely, and I think people were probably on the journey, especially if there was those people that are starting a new business mm. and really not knowing, wh- you know, where to start. And this is what you and I were starting to speak about, which I'd love you to sort of deep dive into a little bit more. For our listeners, what would they expect out of the show? That You were talking about how to get an ABN. We're talking about business plan. Now talk us through some of the content. So uh, we focused on um, initially how to set up a business and it was really how to get an ABN, how to get the sort of information that you need together. It was about networking and how to network. It was about, you know, we've, we've done about the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. 
you know, about entrepreneurial health, physical and mental health. We've talked about really the fundamentals. What does your social media need to look like? What does podcasting look like? What does marketing look like? And we've had specialists from all information, you know, from all their fields come in. We've had people come in and talk about selling. We've had a relationship coach come and talk about the parallels between relationships and also business. We've had, you know, a whole bunch of people come in and, and give their point of view on things. Um, we've also had, you know, some winners of Shark Tank. And we've had some really successful entrepreneurs come in the podcast as well. It's been a it's been a fantastic journey, and I think it's one of those things that, regardless of whatever happens with the podcast now, it's a real legacy to for other people who are looking at starting podcasts because you can go and listen to all of them now and get a really thorough understanding of, you know, especially the mistakes that we made because that's one of the things we talk about a lot is this is what I did wrong so you don't have to. I love that. And, I mean, in every business we all make mistakes and I think I always say, you know, let's fail fail fast so we can move forward because otherwise um, I think sometimes we get stuck in a problem um, I don't believe in problems. I look at them as opportunities, actually. But what were some of your failures going through the whole process? Oh, I've had so many. How much time have you got? How long do you want this <laughs> podcast to go for? Um, so probably publicly one of the, the worst failures, um, one of the hardest lessons that we ever learned. So our podcast, you know, what you're hearing of me now is very much what I'm like, which is exactly who I am in real life and what the podcast is about. And it's all about being authentic and we made a promise to our listeners that we would tell the truth at every turn. And we made a decision that we were going to do. We asked our listeners, what do you guys want from us? We've had so many people writing in. We want to see more of you. We want more videos. We want access to you. How can we do this? And we decided that we we're going to do a road show. The rich version of events is it didn't go very well and no one had warned us not to do an event just after Christmas, which um, we didn't realize. And this was an incredibly valuable lesson. So anyone out there planning a, a trip or a, a work functions just after Christmas don't because it's gonna, it is very hard to get those off the ground. We had massive amount of failure very quickly with venues pulling out, tickets not selling, people pulling out last minute. We had, you know, speakers that were coming and suddenly they couldn't come anymore. It was just after Christmas. And we put down $10,000 on the table and we lost it all. So, we, you know, we lost <clears throat> and we had to come and tell all of our listeners this is what's happened. Mm. So usually we had people writing in saying to us, you know, I usually laugh along with you guys and today I was just crying with you. We made a decision that when we made the decision to pull the pin, we're going to not do this roadshow, we did an announcement. We emailed all the ticket holders, we emailed all our speakers, we emailed, you know, musicians and bands that we had booked, we had to email caterers. It was, you know, a whole it was a whole living organism of people that were involved in this and saying this isn't working and I'm devastated. Um and we just had this overwhelming return of love from the community. Like it was heartbreaking. We went straight onto the podcast after we made the decision and just recorded. And it was the first podcast we've ever walked into without having notes or without having a plan. Like we never script them, we never do anything, but we always sort of go in with like three or four things that we're going to sort of mention. It's always very conversational. And we went on and just, you know, it was this heartbreaking thing where we're both crying, recording a podcast. And then having to listen back to that while you edit is heartbreaking as well. Of course. So, um, you know, we authentically told what really happened. And it was the strangest thing because while we saw this as an absolute failure, all we got was inundated with emails. And they were all so fantastic of people saying, oh, you think that's bad? I blew $50,000 or mm. my heart is breaking with you guys. And we had more sponsors on our Patreon page than ever before. We had people sending us, you know, gift baskets and ringing and being like, I just need to buy you lunch. Do you need a hug? You know, it's just this overwhelming, beautiful kind of response. And what we realized that even that it did fail and it didn't go the way we had planned it to go we really made it safe for people to say I failed we actually proved that we were going to tell you the good the bad and the ugly you know us sobbing into the microphone I can't believe is wet pear-shaped this was actually a really beautiful thing in some ways that we could show people that you know failure isn't fatal <laughs> you're actually going to be okay the trick is dusting yourself off and keep going on the next day 
Well, and it's interesting, isn't it, when you're being authentic, standing in your truth, the community uh, around you just come together, don't they? And oh, they I, do. I, I think for, for me, as I'm listening to you, you know, I always say to myself, there's no such thing as failure, there's only feedback. And I always mm. look at, like, I've gone through some, you know, we've all done that in business. It's, mm-hmm. it's part of your, I think that's what you learn. And I always look at myself and go, well, what was the lesson there, Catherine? So if I was to ask you, Jemima, what was the lesson for you out of that whole experience? What did you learn from it? It really was something that we talked about later and about our lessons and we sort of sat down and went, you know, from from the outset, the gut feeling on it was wrong. And for me, I've always been incredibly intuitive with this sort of stuff. And, you know, everyone was telling us it was going to work. And Chev and I just agreed. We're like, okay, if you think this is going to work, it's great. And we came together at the end of it. I was like, I never thought this was going to work. This is, it, it, you know, from the day one, it was something we realised that our communication needed to be on point and also that we needed to trust ourselves a little bit more. I think, you know, we had scaled too quickly and then suddenly we had all these other people involved in what we were doing. Mm. So we listened to them. We didn't listen to ourselves and that really caused us in a cause and effect way to go, right, we are each other's people here we have each other's you know other people will tell us other things but ultimately it's going to come down to what we decide we're driving this because for a long time the business experiment drove us so it was kind of a nice time to stop as well after that because we'd obviously worked over the Christmas and holiday season obviously with the road show happening just after Christmas we made a decision to have some time off after that and Chev and I just got to hang out as friends rather than business partners which was beautiful and lovely at the same time. Yeah, and you were saying before your gut feeling. So was that one of those mm. things that you had a gut feeling that this wasn't going to land but yeah. you just uh, went against your gut feeling? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we both did. We both listened to what other people were telling us. It's a work, guys. This will be great. You know, I, I've, I've contacted this person. They're all ready to go. You know, I've looked at the venue. It seems fine. Just a lot of things that kind of didn't sit really well and um, that we just listened to other people. And our intuition was both telling us that this wasn't going to work. So it was a really interesting lesson in trusting ourselves, mm. first and foremost, on every turn. And did you get signs along the way? Because, I mean, I've, I've gone through a very similar, probably about five or six years ago, mm. I blew lots of money on an event as well. Mm. And the whole time I had this gut feeling, this is not right, this is not right, but I ignored it. And, you know, there was signs that along the way, like I couldn't get the venue that I wanted, couldn't get the dates that I wanted. And, you know, it was just one thing after another, but I ignored it. Did you have a similar thing where you were getting the signs and you were – you know, ignoring yeah, them. Yeah, we did. We did probably um there were there are loads of them. It was um it was difficult to find venues. It was difficult. It was always difficult. And this is one of the things that I've always found that if something is you put, you know, you can't push a rope. If it's if you're if it's really difficult all the time, something's wrong. You need to stop. <laughs> and yeah. um that's kind of what we found is that at every turn something wasn't quite right. It was always just a little bit harder than it should have been. And, I mean, sometimes the hard is really, really good, but this just was – it was really difficult. This wasn't fun hard. This wasn't pushing through. This wasn't – perseverance wasn't going to get through this. This was kind of fighting, you know, breaking down a brick wall with your bare hands. It just felt like that at every turn, and both of us felt like that. But, again, everyone around us was like, no, guys, this is going to be great. We're really excited for this to happen. So we, you know, didn't trust our guts on this one, and we needed to. Mm. And, and actually, um, it's one of those things you hear quite often about that we um, ignore our gut and it's not till, you know, we get to that end point, whatever that end point is, that you actually look back and go, you know what, I knew all along, but I just totally ignore it. Mm-hmm. So we just yeah. need to back ourselves a bit more. And this is for all of us, including myself. Mm, absolutely. You also mentioned, and I kind of want to unpack this piece as well, you mentioned that some of the five people you spend the most time with is, I guess, a reflection of who you are. And what about if some of these people, I hear this often and I've heard that quite often, but what about if some of these individuals are friends and, you know, over time as we we move on in life, we kind of, people go in different directions, uh, but you still keep in contact with these people. What would be a piece of advice that you would give to our listeners um, if there's, you know, there's certain people they're not aligned with, but we're saying that the, the, the your sum of the five people you spend time with has a reflection of who you are or um, is, uh, um, I guess, the direction you'll end up or, you know, you'll end up heading into or something like that. I'm trying, I'm trying to, uh, I'm, I'm a very visual person here and I'm trying to put it into words what I'm seeing. I hope I'm making sense. 
Absolutely. I'm following you. So you're okay. Um, I'm with you. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, look, definitely you are the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. This is, I've heard this start with five people and I've heard it with seven and 10, but you know, this, the people that you spend the most time with are, are directly going to influence you and who you are and your drive and your ability to perform. And, you know, it's one of the things that people have joked and commented about me that, you know, when they get around me, they're more driven because it's something that I have a lot in me is drive and ambition. And, you know, you can't teach that, but what you can do is showcase this is what it's like to be driven and you can actually really inspire people. Um, I think there are people, and especially on the entrepreneurial journey, for your listeners out there that are going through this journey, you are going to find times where you, you know, you get to a, a road, a fork in the road with the people that you're friends with and not all people are serving you for your entire life. I certainly have relationships with people now that I used to spend one or two days a week with and becoming an entrepreneur that's dropped down to once a month. It doesn't mean that I don't love that person anymore or I care about them. It just means that they're not serving me in the way that I need them to, to influence me and head me in that right direction. Really people either inspire you or they drain you. Mm. so and you just really have to figure out where they where they lie in your life and not feel guilty about that because people change and you're allowed to change and being an entrepreneur is hard it's not easy and so many business owners out there 80 percent of businesses close after five years mm. and we don't spend our time in the right places I think this is a huge reason I don't think the businesses fail after five years I think business owners burn out and mm. I think that a lot of that comes from spending time with the wrong people because you feel like you're obliged to I think a lot of people try to please everyone around them rather than doing what actually needs to be done mm. see I, fi- I find this really fascinating because for me I find that on my journey my entrepreneurial journey is that it's lonely I actually don't have people around me anymore. And so the busier and bigger the business has got, the less friends I have. And so I was wondering if that's a common thing. I mean, I hear that it can be a lonely, a lonely, I guess, um, experience. What are your thoughts on mm. that? Oh, definitely. And I think that a huge part of that, and it's most probably one of my top tips with any entrepreneur out there, is your network is your net worth. So if you're independently doing this alone, you have to surround yourself with people who get it. And you can't, you know, as you know, Catherine, you can't have entrepreneurial conversations with people who aren't entrepreneurs. Your friends don't care. And that's not a criticism to them. They just don't understand and they don't have to. But your people that were, you know, maybe in the not entrepreneurial community, you need to go and find your tribe and your vibe really does attract your tribe. So if you're really you know, if you're really ambitious, you will find other ambitious people, but it's a lot of work. You have to actually make an effort to do that because it can be incredibly isolating. And I don't think we talk about the toll that being independent and being, you know, a solopreneur, because I mean, you know, Catherine, we can spend days at home without leaving the house if you have to. It's amazing. Now you can ring Coles and have groceries delivered. You can get anything delivered to your house right now. And when you're working from home, really, you can stay here and do what you do. Mm. But we have to make, we need to have those connections. And so anyone out there, you know, there are a lot of networking groups. Networking is not something a lot of people like doing, but I can guarantee you that it is absolutely fundamental in your journey as an entrepreneur to find like-minded people. Because if you're independently doing it yourself, it just makes it a little bit harder than it should be. And, and you don't really need to do uh, that. I mean, you don't have to leave home to do that either, networking. I mean, there's so many no. different ways you can do it, uh, mastermind groups or like, how do you go about networking, for example? Um, so I'm a huge fan of networking and always have been. So, you know, very early on I did a lot of uh, female networking and joined groups like that. I'm one of the leaders in a in a networking group called BX Networking, which is based in Sydney, which is the brain tired of Matt Alderton. Um, I've been to B&Is. I've done business in heels. I've done Canberra Women in Business. I've attended um, artist retreats for, you know, for silversmiths just to meet like-minded people. And I think that, you know, I've also found solace in places on Facebook and in mastermind groups and courses and signed up to, you know, one or two day conferences just to get additional people in front of me and I think networking is 
a really important part of that. And if you aren't someone who that comes easily to, it, it is difficult. And even if it does come easily to you, such as myself, it is still sometimes a challenge to walk into a room of people that you don't know. But again, from just a pure business point of view, even if the person that you're talking to isn't going to offer you a sale or build you someone that you don't see a friendship going with, who do they know that's potentially going to help you along in your journey as well? Mm, so true. And quite often you'll hear that <coughs> some entrepreneurs are uh, introverts, uh, they are too tired to go out. So it's it's a bit of a, um, I guess it's one of those things you really do need to make the effort and plan it in. I know for myself when it comes to networking, um, mm. I mean, because I, I do a lot of, uh, you know, I facilitate groups and coaching during the day that when it comes to networking, it's one of those things that I don't get around to do because I'm just exhausted and I don't want to talk. I've been talking all day. <laughs> it, and it is hard. I'll be the first one to admit, you know, I remember, um, you know, I'm, I'm very committed to what I'm doing and I'm the first person to admit to that. And my fiance, God love him, he's amazing, but he sort of has to remind me every now and again of, okay, your work is part of your life. It's not the whole thing. And, you know, I got off a plane from Cambodia, got in the front door, and 20 minutes later a friend picked me up to go to a networking event um, because I had to go. It was one of those, this is going to be an amazing opportunity. This is this only happens once a year. This was, you know, it was really I picked this opportunity. I was like, no, I have to go to this. This was the commitment I made, and it, it was hard I had spent two weeks overseas and I arrived, you know, I was beautiful Southeast Asia, traveling, backpacking, you know, I, I rocked up to this event sunburnt in the middle of Canberra winter, minus degrees, and sort of went, okay, I'm here because I'd made that commitment. It was in my diary, you know, nothing makes my diary that I don't 100% attend. Mm. Wow, it's amazing. But that's the that energy that you have, that high energy. <laughs> Than having to have a sleep that night and didn't get out of bed till, you know, 10 o'clock the next day. But, yeah, high energy for the moment. Yeah, yeah. So, Jemima, we always love to ask our women of inspiration about some of their pain points in business. We all have pain points. What would be some of your biggest pain points in your mm. business? Um, so multiple pick a business and I can give you a bunch. Um, probably one of the biggest issues, sort of pain points that I've had is that I um, really suffer from – um, lack of self-care and you know you you've spoken a few times about high energy and I have multiple businesses and I have a life that I adore but it actually can actually be the biggest downfall for me if I don't have self-care um, in t one of the things that made me leave law enforcement in 2015 was that I had my first ever panic attack and what I didn't understand at that time was the chemical reasons why I didn't understand about cortisol I didn't understand about that if I, if I didn't decompress, how dangerous that could be. And that became, you know, a real, anyone that's gone down that rabbit hole is just, if you don't address anxiety, it really quickly turns into depression. It really quickly zaps all of the energy out of you. And I had to really find and be authentic about what was happening to me and actually admit this is not right and I'm not feeling well. And that was a really, really difficult challenge for me. But that has remained an ongoing issue. Given that I'm busy, I have to build self-care. And this goes back into sort of this networking idea, right, is that I have to schedule it in my diary, which is why if it makes it in my diary, I have to do it. Mm. So and I have to set reminders. I have to have self-care time. I have to meditate. I have to stop. I have to, you know, sit myself in front of a TV and watch an episode of something. I have to do exercise. I have to go to a boxing class. I have to do these things. And if they aren't done, it is a real, it becomes the biggest pain point in my entire life, no. not just my business. No, and I can relate with what you're saying. I had exactly mm. the same thing in 2011. I was in New York and uh, thought I was having a heart attack and got taken away via ambulance and uh, they told me I had a panic attack, which I'd never, ever experienced in my life. Mm. And then coming back to Melbourne was it debilitated me for a year. So I pretty much locked up, locked myself up for a year um, because it was just, I was just too afraid that it would happen out in public again, um, you know, have the whole con convulsions and everything. And, uh, mm. but I, when I did, I did actually uh, write a book about it. So I did a lot of, not write about, the panic attacks, but it actually, mm. I did a lot of soul searching, a lot of, lot of inner deep work 
to find out what the hell was going on. Yeah, it's often, it's one of those interesting things. And um, someone asked me recently about why do you talk about this? You know, this is, you know, this is uncomfortable. Why would you talk about this? And I was like, because I'm not the only one. And one of the things that was most painful to me was over time I would I would say to people, I'm actually having a really rough time at the moment when I'd be cancelling things or not attending something, and people would say, you know, are you okay? What's going on? I was like, I'm actually suffering really bad anxiety and depression at the moment and I can't get through this and this is really complicated. And people would say, I've been through this for years. And these are people that I knew really well and I found it really difficult be- because – these were people that I considered friends and that I had relationships with and suddenly they're telling me they're not well and I didn't know and, you know, each person would have their their bit of advice. And, you know, being entre- an entrepreneur is hard enough. Mm. Being an entrepreneur that's going through mental health issues is even more isolating and I think we need to be honest about it. I think one of the key things for me is that you have to be honest about it and really for me it was about figuring out where this all came from and this isn't probably – the right the right interview for going through all of that stuff and anyone that wants to talk about it happy to get in touch with happy for them to get in touch with me and you know Catherine have a full discussion about this with you later but you know there's a whole bunch of things that go into healing but you really need to figure out where this came from and what is what, what it's trying to bring your attention to yeah exactly and I don't think there's anything wrong with it mind you I kept it a secret for a very long time because Mm. I was if anything I looked at it as a sign of weakness and and I think um now what I call about and I actually did there was a journalist who actually uh wanted to do a story on it and I said yeah why not and then when I actually did it I actually was really scared about everyone knowing about it but you know what Mm. I think now I call it my gift I know when I push myself too hard as you know as an entrepreneur we just work ourselves to the ground because it doesn't actually feel like we're working a day in our life because we love what we do and that's the danger in it Um, but you know that sometimes you push yourself push yourself and I know I can feel it when I'm starting my body's starting to feel anxious and I I, I turned it around and went well that's a gift because now I know I can listen to my body stay in tune with my body And I don't think there's anything wrong now about talking about it because I remember when I first experienced it, I was researching. I wanted to speak to other people who had experienced it. I wanted to know more about it and there was nothing that I um, could do uh, except for I think it was Beyond Blue were the only ones that really, you know, had a lot of articles about it. But there was no one. I wanted to speak to somebody that was actually going through it. Yeah, and it's 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 still difficult now to find people, and that's why I sort of went, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to speak about my experiences. It doesn't scare me anymore, and I think you know, anxiety. I didn't go into a full depression, but my anxiety got became so out of control that I was fastly going there, mm. and there was a lot of intervention that happened, and doctors saying, okay, it's time for you to go on medication, and I fought like it was it was impressive. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not doing this. I've got this because I had had this. I'd worked in law enforcement for 10 years. Mm. I was the girl who, you know, the 20 something walked into an, a male 85% dominated male workforce and was like, I've got these guys and worked in awful situations and did things that I never thought was were possible or, or be part of my life, you know, um, crime scenes and dead bodies and dealing with all this stuff and suddenly um, my own body is attacking itself. What's going on here? So it was a real sign of weakness and I didn't want to admit that I couldn't handle it. Mm. And when sort of the doctor, and it was this beautiful doctor who in many ways potentially possibly saved my life, and he said to me, um, look, I wear glasses. I wear glasses because I'm hindered and my eyesight isn't great. Your brain chemicals dull and a mess at the moment. You need to take this medication. I was like, oh, okay, thank you. And he explained it to me in very logical terms. This wasn't a failure. And this is the hardest part of this is that we put so much stigma on ourselves. It's already hard enough. Let's not make it worse. And let's not pretend everything's fine. And this is part of the reason that the business experiment, I believe, has had so much success and so many people have really understood that is because we don't make it look glamorous. We're not fancy about it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and burn burnout. I mean, for me, it was definitely burnout. When I think about what was I doing before it, I was yeah. definitely working myself down to the ground. So burnout was the thing that really stands out for me. So, Jemima, what we love to do as we wrap up the show, we always love to ask our woman of inspiration to pick one word that best describes her personal brand. What would be that one word for you? 
authentic, I think. <laughs> I think authentic is mine. I, I was going to say, yeah, authentic, raw, you know, I think that you really are uh, an individual who stands in her truth for sure. Mm, happy to do that, although, you know, as it stays where, you know, we do paint ourselves in corners, you know. I've, I've promised that I'll be authentic and I, I absolutely love doing it. Um, and I think, you know, living your truth is a really fun thing. You don't have to pretend like you're having the best day ever. How's your day going? It's okay. I'm a bit tired today. Okay, great. Being authentic is beautiful. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. So true. So true. And the other thing we do is we love to wrap up with uh, three gold nuggets. So what would be those three shiny gold nuggets that you would like to leave for our listeners today? So my, my, oh, I love this question and I loved this being asked. I was like, oh my goodness, my top three things. So I think first of all, one thing that entrepreneurs all lack is patience. We want the instant, I want this to work now. And I see it consistently, as you said earlier, Catherine, you do mentoring and stuff and you will have seen it as well. And so many other entrepreneurs, the person who's after that quick, the quick money that, you know, I'm going to try this. It doesn't work in six months. I jump to something else. You know, um, you know, if you go and have a look at people who, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger 17 years without getting a, getting a part in a movie, that, that's impressive, right? He, mm. he kept auditioning for all that amount of time. Walt Disney, 200 times he put an application in to get the funding for his park. Like, it's not going to be the first time. You just have to be patient for it. Um, one of my favourite people in the world is Gary Vaynerchuk, and I think he's a fantastic entrepreneur, and he is just, again, embodies authenticness and authenticity as a whole. And he, um, he talks about that no one watched any of his videos for 18 months and every day he put content out, every day, and it took 18 months for it to stick. And patience above all else, if you're starting a business, it's not going to happen overnight. Don't expect miracles. You have to, if you want to have that 1% lifestyle, you have got to be patient. Mm. I agree with that. I, I That resonates with me absolutely because I get that quite often I get asked, oh, what exactly did you do to get to where you are? And I said, honey, I've mm. been in business for 10 years. It didn't happen yeah. overnight. It took a lot of work. Mm. So I love that. Thank you so very much. So uh, do you have any others? Yeah. So um, my other favourite one is one is greater than zero, mm. which is the idea that – I'm just going to add this one in here, sneak it in. Um, one is better than zero. So this is something that was raised to me a little while ago when someone said to me, Oh, and this kind of leads into the patience thing a little bit. And it was, why would you do that interview? They only have a thousand people who download their magazine. I was like, because I don't know who those thousand people are. I would rather go and have an interview with someone who has six very in tune listeners than, you know, 20,000 who aren't engaging with them at all. Mm. So, you know, I think it's about it's about paying your dues a little bit, but at the same time, you don't know. I, I take every opportunity. One person is better than zero. Mm. So if you get an opportunity, jump at it. Always take the opportunity. Do the interviews. Do the blogs. Do the podcast. Do the do the you know the five a.m. interviews. Do the two a.m. interviews. I've done all of them, and they're fantastic because it's always another person that you can reach. It's another form of networking to link this all back into itself. But it's one of those things that, you know, regardless of what is asked of you, you have to take the opportunity. So one is better than zero. Mm, I love that and so true. I think that even with us when we uh, – uh, with podcasts, I know some podcasters, they won't have uh, guests unless they have a big following or, you know, and for us, it's about the story. It's not about the yeah. following. Uh, and we've just recently did a summit as well. It's about the story. We go for the story, not Absolutely. about how many people you've got on social media. Yeah, you know, the engagement is everything. No, true, true, true. So for our listeners, where can they find you, Jemima? Where's the best place to go? So the best location to find me is um, www.jemimaashley.com.au. I've also um, on epicsocial.com.au and thebusinessexperiment.com.au and tangsdesign.com.au as well. <laughs> Wow, I can't say how impressed I am with everything that you do. And as for our listeners, I was just uh, telling Jemima, she looks about 22, you know, 23. And oh, she's, stop. <laughs> she's done all of this amazing stuff, which I think it's an absolutely a credit to you. And uh, thank you so much for your time, your energy and sharing your story. 
Oh, thank you so much for having me. We've had a great time. It's been awesome. Thank you. That brings us to the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed the show as it is my mission to reach out and inspire as many individuals like you. And one of the best ways to help us achieve this goal is by giving us a good review on iTunes. It's easy and it only takes about 10 seconds. If you have any questions or special guests that you would like to hear from, please send us an email to support at katherineplano.com.au and we will get right back to you. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter or Facebook at Catherine Plano. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Until next week, please take care.